everybody, my friends. It's time for another edition of Things We Said Today, a Beatle podcast coming your way every other week. My name is Darren DeVivo from WFUV Radio in New York City. I'm one of the three hosts of Things We Said Today, and joining me are good friends of mine and yours as well, Ken Michaels, the host of Every Little Thing, a weekly Beatles radio show that Ken's been hosting uh, since 18, no, I'm kidding, since <laughs> 1982. It's in syndication now, as uh, Ken brings together, of course, lots of Beatle music and news and trivia and themes. The, many of the shows are, are uh, thematic. That's Every Little Thing. And Ken is also the co-host of uh, another podcast. Actually, this is a video cast called Talk More Talk. And he's one of four hosts of Talk More Talk that deal specifically with the solo Beatles. So how are you, Ken? I'm doing great, Darren. Thanks Did I for... get on everything right? You got everything right there. I'm going right. to hire you as my publicist. Oh, right. All right, right there. <laughs> and also uh, here is Alan Cozen, the New York Times classical music critic for some 38 years uh, and Beatles author as well. He's uh, written a bunch of books, uh, single out the Beatles from the cavern to the rooftop, and got that something, how the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, changed everything. And these days, uh, he writes for a bunch of publications, including the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, and highlights for children as well. <laughs> I'm just they probably kidding. pay well. <laughs> and, huh. and fill in the blank on the few that uh, I am missing, Alan. Oh, I don't know. Um... Well, he Beatle doesn't fan, remember you know? <laughs> Beatle, Beatle fan. fan. I'm, yeah, I'm a contributing editor of Beatle fan for uh, since the early '80s, so I should mention them because that's hmm. very important. Absolutely. So here we are, Darren, Ken, and Alan. It's things we said today. Our first, uh, I think this is our first show of the spring of 2019. It's snowing here in Portland. I got to tell you. Our... <laughs> Yeah, it was snow. it was snowing in in Pennsylvania like a couple of days ago. So no, it's in the seventies here in New York. Okay, hmm. and it's it's kind of warm here in Connecticut. So so we're not be, suffering. Before we get started uh, with the topic for today, Ken's rounded up uh, news for this show. News of uh, the week or weeks, actually. The last three weeks, but I'm going to condense it because there's way too much to cover. I'm going to start with the news that broke a few days ago that a new film documentary will be in theaters and will open on May the 24th at Arclight's Cinerama Dome in Los Angeles. And it's called Echoes of the Canyon, which explores the, uh, the robust music scene at Laurel Canyon in the 60s when the Birds, the Beach Boys, Buffalo Springfield, the Mamas and Papas, they were all thriving and uh, Ringo Starr is one of the artists who was interviewed in the film, as are people who were a part of it, the artists that I just mentioned. And um, so that's something that we have to look forward to. Uh, there'll also be an album coming out to tie in with this, with artists like Jacob Dylan, Cat Power, Beck, and Regina Spector, all interpreting music from those artists that I just mentioned from the Laurel Canyon days. Nice. Also, uh, Paul McCartney is now making available the film The Bruce McMouse Show separately. And you can purchase it as a download or you can rent it. It's now available on iTunes. And as we all know, it was part animation, part live concert footage of early Wings concerts. So that's now available on its own. All right. Just recently, we heard the news that the Beatles Cirque du Soleil show Love in Las Vegas achieved a milestone with its 6,000th performance. So so congratulations to the cast and crew for uh, keeping the show exciting since it started in 2006. Who would have thought (laughs) that this show would be so successful that it's been running now for 13 years? Show of hands. Who's seen it? Oh, so at once. I have my hand up, but you wouldn't know that. Cause it, uh, but I, I did see it once myself, and I'm assuming Alan did. I did, yeah. I saw the 10th anniversary show. Oh, okay. You didn't see it when it debuted? I did not. I had refused in principle. 
<laughs> because, um, well, I mean, back then I was still basically the Times' as Beatles desk, and they had uh, where they were pitching this to me, and I felt that I should take the stand that until they put out the remastered CDs and maybe some more unreleased stuff, they were sort of wasting their time doing a site-specific, you know, circus show in Las Vegas. But uh, that that kind of meant I still needed to, you know, somehow acknowledge that it was happening. And they said, uh, well, if if you won't go to Las Vegas, uh, if Giles comes to New York with his hard drive, would you agree to meet him in a studio and listen to the mixes? And I mean, hey, can't turn that down. Uh, mm. And that was a lot of fun. I mean, hearing it right from his drive, you know, in studio conditions with... Um, studio speakers and uh, gotta say it sounded incredible um okay. but then when the uh when the 10th anniversary came around i i thought okay well they've they've put out the reissues they've been doing remixes um I, I i can't say that they're not doing what i want them to do which after all is apple's job um <laughs> so mm. i went and uh really enjoyed it okay. uh, when i went out there it was a quick trip uh, to San Diego, uh, L.A., and Las Vegas with the family. And uh, I, it was perfect timing because uh, when we were in L.A., which was literally for half a day, uh, I got to spend a considerable amount of time at Amoeba Records. And then we were right near the Grammy Museum in L.A., and they had a Ringo Starr exhibition going on. Uh, and this was, I don't know, this was maybe five years ago, give or take. Actually, mm -hmm. it was in 2013, come to think of it. And uh, it was also uh, some of the hottest weather, if you could believe this, that they've had out there. Because in Las Vegas, they were complaining about the 119 degree day uh, that we were there. So I sat at a shaded bar outside and see how long I last would last in 119 degree weather. It was not one beer. It was less than that. I couldn't deal. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well. I, I got to see the show once and really enjoyed it, and I do plan on going back to Las Vegas, and when I do, I'll make sure I see it again, since they updated it not mm -hmm. that long ago. Um, but it was a great experience. The only problem I had with seeing it was that they give you a set of headphones to hear the music as you're watching what's on the stage, and it's so distracting because I'm so drawn to the music, and I'm hearing things that I hadn't heard before that I'm not paying as much attention to what's going on on the stage, but it was really well done. And uh, really had a great time seeing it. And like I said, plan to see it again. Ken, when did you see it? It was not that long after they opened. Probably around 2007, 2008. Okay, because like I said, I was there in 2013 and they did not give out headphones. But they did have seats that had speakers in the headrest behind you, right and left channel. And uh, so if you put your head back, it was like, I guess, like having headphones. Maybe that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah, okay. probably because I think that was always a design. You're you're getting it not only from the headrest, but the seat in front of you. I think has speakers on the back of it, and you're you're completely surrounded by it. Right. Um, also, you know, point, if you go, was... if you if you go to the show and and you go really early, like as soon as the doors open, you can listen to, you know, maybe half an hour, forty five minutes of. Beatles mixes, usually, uh, generally speaking, without the vocals, but instrumental mixes, and uh, they're not just the standard instrumental mixes. There's, there's there's other stuff going on, and it's really kind of interesting. I believe I may have accidentally taped it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, those are those are kind of cool, actually. I don't I don't know you, Alan. <laughs> I don't know you. When they're <laughs> The doorbell rings and uh, the FBI's at the door. I was, uh, after I realized there was sound coming out from behind my head, I was like, I wish too bad they didn't put it in the seat cushion, too. Mm. That would kind of be like 5.1, 5. 5. Um, <laughs> you know, coming up from my bottom and on either side of my head. But, yeah. All right. Enough on love. Okay. There's some sad news to report, and that's on the passing of Joe Flattery who was one of the key figures in the early years of the Beatles, and he was the group's booking manager in 1962 and 63, he was a lifelong friend and close confidant to Brian Epstein, who he had known since childhood. And uh, Joe has been described as the secret Beatle, and he would share his 
firsthand experience of his knowledge of the Beatles during their formative years with the rest of the world. And uh, right up to his death, he had planned on going to Norway to take part in a Beatles convention there. Uh, Joe's association with the Beatles began when he had a flat in uh, Gardner Road in Stonycroft, which became a meeting place for Merseyside bands from 1959 onwards, especially late at night after they'd played gigs around that area. And Joe said members of the Beatles would often sleep at the flat and he would run them home in his car the next morning. He actually gave George Harrison driving lessons on his way home in Speak. And uh, a quote from Joe, he said, it was a very exciting time. The Beatles were more with me than Brian in the early days. And uh, he also managed his brother's band, which was Lee Curtis and the All-Stars. And he put out a book about his experiences uh, in his uh, autobiography, which is called Standing in the Wings, The Beatles, Brian and Me, which was published in 2013. So Joe Flannery has passed away and he was 87 there are, um, I believe, some people who feel that Joe uh, seriously exaggerated his um, involvement with Brian and the Beatles and that uh, ultimately Brian and Joe were really competitors in a way. Uh, uh, it is worth looking up for listeners who have this on their shelves, which everyone should. It's worth looking up in uh, Mark Lewison's Tune In. Um, the Joe Flannery sections, because some of it is actually pretty funny, including the incident where, because he wanted Pete Best to join Lee Curtis in the All-Stars, he actually sort of blurted out the news that Pete had not yet heard that he had been sacked by the Beatles, and Pete didn't actually even know what he was talking about. Mm. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. Okay, How, did you read his book, Alan? Joe's? Yeah. Uh, yeah, long ago. I can't uh, recall much about it, but yeah. Okay. Well, something I'd like to investigate in at some point. And um, I know that you guys have some news about a John Lennon release for Record Star Day. Uh, right. Okay. Um, there is John Lennon's Imagine Raw Studio Mixes, uh, which is going to be coming out. It's, it basically is material from the ultimate collection you know the imagined release that uh, was out in the fall but it is on vinyl and it is sequenced in the order of the imagine album but it's the raw takes without the string overdubs and the um, studio enhancements like you know extra reverb whatever so it's kind of like the the finished takes of the imagine album but without the production touches as they tend to do on record store day they'll They'll do these vinyl albums that will actually be kind of uh, abridged versions, maybe of bigger releases that either have come out or will come out. So I guess they kind of uh, skimmed some of the uh, cool stuff from the Imagine box set and turning it into now a standalone vinyl only album, which could be a little a little deceiving in, in so much that some folks might think, oh, it's all it's additional stuff that wasn't on the box set and it's on vinyl. How cool. But um, no, it is stuff from the from the box set. There is also, if you can allow me to chime in with two things here, sure. releases that folks might be interested in. There's an Elvis Costello EP, which is actually being credited to Elvis Costello and the Imposters. It's called Purse, the words and music of Burt Backrack, Paul McCartney, Johnny Cash and Bob Dylan with Elvis Costello. They don't get in too much detail about the source of the four songs on on the EP, but uh, two songs per side, and the second uh, song on side one will be The Lovers That Never Were, which uh, was on Paul's Off the Ground, and it's one of the Paul McCartney, Elvis Costello compositions, so this will either be a demo, this could be perhaps, maybe, a new recording, being that it's being credited to Elvis Costello and the Imposters, but in any event, uh, it is uh, coming out also on Record Store Day, Purse, the name of it, a new EP from Elvis Costello and the Imposters. And in addition to that, there's going to be a Bad Finger album that I'm very excited about, which is, as I try to pull up the specifics, title and all, going to be a collection, here it is, called So Fine, The Warner Brothers Rarities. And it is coming out as a double album, 900 copies, limited run, featuring all the unreleased 
bonus tracks that were on the most recent deluxe CD reissues of the two Warner Brothers albums, Bad Finger and Wish You Were Here. So those CDs were reissued last year by Real Gone Music, and now Real Gone Music is collecting all of the unreleased bonus tracks from those two CDs and putting them on a double LP coming on Record Store Day, which is April 13th. They're Saturday, and again, the Bad Fingers go so fine, the Warner Brothers rarities. Okay. Good stuff right there to know about for Record Store Day. Um, also, uh, Zach Starkey and Sharna Laguz, it's spelled L-I-G-U-Z, they have announced the formation of a new reggae record label, which is called Trojan Jamaica, and they have a new, what they call a groundbreaking album called Red, Gold, Green, and Blue, and details will be coming out soon about that. Just released for streaming and downloading is a new recording of the Screamin' Jay Hawkins song, I Put a Spell on You, performed by Michael Rose, featuring Sly and Robbie, and the track was produced by Youth, the same guy that Paul worked with as part of his Fireman projects, who also worked with U2 and The Verve. There's a new video for this song, I Put a Spell on You, and Zach Starkey is in it, playing electric guitar. So, uh... We hear on every show news about the Beatles' children and how active they are, and now is Zach Starkey involved with this new label. All right, something that we should talk about, and I'm sure both of you know about this, but the Beatles' recording of Help is now being used in a TV commercial for Google. And um, it's interesting because if you remember way back in the late 80s, the Nike company used Revolution, the Beatles' recording of Revolution, in their TV commercial, and that sparked a lot of controversy. The Beatles themselves were not pleased about it, and there's a huge difference between using a Beatles song and using the actual Beatles recording. So this is, um, this. I can't remember the last time this happened when it was an actual Beatles recording. Maybe there was one in between Revolution and this, but um, there have been lots of Beatles songs used in commercials, but not a Beatles recording. Have you guys seen the commercial? Because they actually show the front cover of the Help album yeah. very briefly. Yeah, I've seen it. And and I, I you, saw it last night. Yeah. How do you feel about it? I don't care. I don't care either. I'm I think I think the commercial is pretty good. I mean, it's 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 about um, you how you can use Google to help you find how to do various things. Um, so it thematically it kind of works with Help as a song. And, uh, you know, my, my feeling sort of is that ultimately this is a decision that um, I, I'm pretty sure that Apple has to give permission, um, which means Apple being, you know, Yoko and Olivia and Ringo and Paul. And if they decide that this is what they want to do as their business decision, like, who am I to say that they shouldn't? Mm. I think it was more taboo, like what, no. 80s late 80s yeah and I, that all went out the window i mean there was so many musicians that have actually uh maybe not so much recently maybe recently used commercials as a means to get their music heard right that the whole thing with me uh you know songs being used in commercials is to me now you know it's old it's irrelevant it happens and i don't even pay attention yeah i mean my opinion about this whole thing has changed 180 degrees since the revolution commercial happened because there were people then that thought that it really cheapened the song and cheapened the catalog. Yeah. And George Harrison himself at the time, this was all around the time of cloud nine, you know, he was very vocal about it. He would talk about how the Beatles were made offers all the time for the songs to be used in commercials, but they always said no. And, um, he said he didn't want their songs to be used in something that would be really in bad taste like sausages or women's panties <laughs> or things like that. And, exactly. Uh, exactly. How did you get sausages and women's panties in the same? Uh, I don't sentence? know. <laughs> we need to, God knows what I'm thinking about here. But uh, uh, we need that. We need to talk after the show is over. Here. <laughs> okay. But um, nowadays, I just think there's so much competition out there between new music and old music, and it's a good way to get the music out there and possibly introduce it to new generations of fans. And so you see tons of commercials nowadays where they use old songs. And recently I've, I've heard a lot of uh, Harry Nilsson music or 
Kinks music used in in uh, in TV commercials, and I think it's fine if if somehow young people hear it and they find out that it's a Beatles song and they like what they hear in the commercial and it leads to them getting one of their albums and maybe from from that then they become a fan. Then I'm all for it. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. I mean, what you had said about the the time that the revolution thing came out and the way everything was looked at and the way the Beatles felt about, you know, having rejected offers all the time. And I mean, all that's true, but I don't know that it even matters today. And it's not like, I don't know, people are, there are people who are really upset about this. I mean, I've had quite a number of emails and uh, someone did a, a tweet on Twitter where they complain about this, and they tagged me, Yoko, Olivia, Paul, and Ringo. Like I have something to say about this. Like, what, like well, uh, you know, what's what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> we know um, you do, Alan. You know. <laughs> yeah, fess right. up. Yes. Well, well, you could look at it this way. Um, if uh, the Beatles weren't making money from the sale of uh, the rights to use their songs in commercials, they might have to be putting out these huge, expensive box sets that would cost us... Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'd but rather you know, they did that. <laughs> it's a whole world out there uh, that there are, there are people whose job it is to place old music... Mm -hmm. somewhere whether it be commercials or movies or video games or whatever yeah and if young people discover old music that way then that's a good thing so exactly anyway a few other news items lawrence juber who was great at the fest uh last weekend has a new album coming out April 26th. It's called Downtown, named after the Petula Clark hit. It's basically an album of standards plus one original. And he did indicate at the fest that he will be working on what will be his fourth CD of Beatle covers, which he does magnificently on acoustic guitar. So uh, Lawrence Juber's new album called Downtown, again, due out April the 26th. And Alan, you've got uh, a major story to tell us. Okay, yeah, I uh, I got a preview of the Metropolitan Museum's new exhibition, which is called Play It Loud, The Instruments of Rock and Roll. And it's a collaboration between the Met and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, and what they've done is, uh, you know, the Met has a permanent instrument collection, and it's instruments from all cultures all over the world, um, some of them quite valuable, some, you know, but really it's, it's an incredible collection. If you're in the Met, you should just look at anyway. But this exhibition opened on April 8th and uh, runs through October 1st. And it's got instruments from something like 80 musicians, including, you know, for our purposes, the interesting stuff is uh, George Harrison's Hofner Club 30 guitar, which was his first electric guitar. Uh, and it's, you know, it's kind of a crappy guitar, but it is pretty historical. I mean, it sort of bridged the period from the Quarrymen to the Beatles. And I was looking at it, looking at it from the side, you, you can see it's got really a pretty high string action. That must have not been that comfortable to play. They also have uh, Ringo's first Ludwig drum set um, with the Beatles logo on the front with the drop T, all of that. There is a Rickenbacker 12 string. Uh, it's, a sort of, it's like the Rickenbacker 325 of John's, but this is a 12 string model, um, also given to John and loaned for this exhibition by Yoko, I believe. And it's a, a 12 string guitar, but, uh, you know, it, from the front, it looks like a six because the way Rickenbacker made it is that six pegs were, you know, to the side the way the normal pegs are, and the other six pegs face the back. So you can only see those from the side. Um, mm. There is, they have a, uh, a Hofner bass that looks like Paul's but isn't Paul's, but they have it right next to one of Paul's that was made for him uh, for the Palace at the Party. So it's a, the Hofner bass with the, the Union Jack 
painted, you know, it's painted as a Union Jack. The whole thing is a big Union Jack in the shape of a Hofner base, um, but it's a functioning base. They have the Rickenbacker, I think it's a 425 that George played on the I Want to Hold Your Hand sessions and uh, various radio and TV sessions for for a while. I don't think he brought it on tour. And, uh, you know, otherwise they've got, uh, you know, in, in very peripherally Beatles related, there is a, uh, a, a Fender, I believe it's an SG, that George Harrison gave to Eric Clapton as a gift. And Eric's, well, Robert Stigwood, I guess, had that guitar plus a bass of Jack's, Jack Bruce's and a drum head of Ginger Baker's painted by the artists who became the fool. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Maria Kroger and Simon Postrum, I think. And uh, the drum head isn't there, but the guitar and the bass are both in the exhibition. Um, there's lots of stuff from Jimmy Page, uh, Van Halen. I mean, there's, you walk in, the first thing you see standing entirely on its own against the wall is the Gibson guitar that Chuck Berry used to record uh, uh, Johnny B. Good and lots of other stuff. But uh, so it's, it's really a fun exhibition. It um, goes pretty much up to the present. I mean, there, there, you know, there's a guitar of, of Annie Clark, who is better known as St. Vincent, one that mm-hmm. she helped design. Um, oh, cool. Yeah. There's a couple of Prince's guitars. There's a Lady Gaga piano with, uh, you know, outcroppings of acrylic and uh, LED lights. But tons of, you know, 60s guys are in this show. Uh, And a very, well, comparatively few women, but uh, more than originally when the show was announced, there were complaints that there weren't any women. But there are 11 of the 80 artists in the show are women and I, I asked the curators about this and they said listen you know in early rock especially women tended to be singers rather than instrumentalists um, and nevertheless they try to accommodate that by pointing out with one of Bo Diddley's guitars that there were some women guitarists in his band who used the same model and they mentioned that and they have a guitar that is the model used by Sister Rosetta Thorpe, but isn't her guitar. But they wanted the model in there to at least represent the one that she used. It was a rare sort of, um, it was a, a Gibson Les Paul custom, but with an SG design. And the Les Paul and the SG eventually sort of split into two lines. So, um, but anyway, the show runs through October 1st. Um, there's tons of great stuff there. Uh, you can easily spend a couple of hours just sort of walking through and um, looking and listening to things. Uh, you can't play the instruments, obviously. But there is a section where they have um, uh, stage rigs of Jimmy Page, Keith Richards, Van Halen, and um, Tom Morello from Rage Against the Machine. And each of them, each of those has a video screen where Page, Keith, Van Halen, and, and Tom Morello talk about their instruments and the sounds they get and uh jimmy page actually plays a bunch of stuff from led zeppelin one it's it's like listening to just the guitar track he plays it exactly as it was and also you know bit of stairway to heaven whole lot of love stuff like that and it, it's interesting hearing them all talk about their relationships to their instruments too you know keith is keith so <laughs> He's hmm. always Keith. <laughs> so, so it's yeah. Like I say, it's 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 a good show. There till October first. You should pop in and see it. And I want to know how you found out, Alan. You weren't supposed to play the instruments. You, did you try to grab one of the guitars or something? <laughs> oh, they're when behind. security wasn't looking. Yeah, no, I I, I didn't. They were behind glass, um, but uh, <laughs> you can't really get to them. But you can get close. You can get a really good close look. Hey, they have got the Mellotron that was used on 2,000 Light Years from Home and uh, oh, cool. you know other things mm. on Satanic Majesties. Uh, the dulcimer that uh, Brian Jones used for Lady Jane. So there's really tons of great stuff there. Did they tell you if this is the first time many of these items have been on display? Because I'm not aware of 
all the different exhibits at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I've only been there a few times, but you know, did they make it clear whether this is the first time some of these items have been put on display? Um, they didn't say. Uh, you know, a, a lot of them. Okay, a lot of them were loaned by the musicians themselves, and and so those probably have only been seen in concert, you know, or in pictures. A few came from the Rock and Roll Hall of, of Fame's collection, so those have probably been seen. Um, hmm. And some come from, some from private collectors, and so they might have been seen only if you happen to go down to Sotheby's and see them, you know, before they were auctioned. Sotheby's or whoever auctioned them, I should say. Um, yeah. So, yeah, they they didn't make the point of that, but that probably is true. I mean, I, I can't remember uh, when I would have had an opportunity to see George's Club 40, you know. Hmm. I tell you what intrigues me are those items that uh, you mentioned that were painted by the fool. Yeah. I mean, how much can there be? They only worked for Apple for a very short period of time, so this was before Apple actually. This was in they painted these in nineteen sixty seven. Ah. And they're beautiful. Okay. They are beautiful. They're really, you know, stunningly painted. Gotta say. So, okay. Yeah. Well, that sounds like uh, maybe multiple trips to the museum to see this. <laughs> yeah. And one last news item since we're doing this on April the 8th. We send out happy birthday wishes to Julian Lennon, who, believe it or not, is now 56. Whoa. You sure you did the math right there? Yes, I am correct. Or uh, 1963. Wow. Yeah. It seems like just yesterday the, the lot was coming out. And yeah. we were all like going crazy at FUV when it, we get the package from Atlantic Records with the advanced 12 inch single of the lot. And it was like, holy smokes, he sounds like his father. Yep. Yeah, I remember playing that when uh, I was on the air at WDHA in New Jersey. I, I always, <laughs> to, to give people an idea of how long I've been doing this and you've been doing this now, and it, 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 I can just list albums that I played as soon as I started in radio. and. You know, Tug of War was the album for me when I started doing Beatles shows. And a year into WDHA, there was the lot. So, mm. you know. Uh, speaking of sounding like his father, there, there was recently, uh, recently, just this week, uh, sort of a dialogue on Instagram between Sean Lennon and Francis Bean Cobain, where Sean started by saying that he gets criticized a lot for supposedly trying to look like his father or even his mother and it was the occasion by the fact that i think he was wearing you know round glasses and he said you know these just happen to suit my face and francis bean uh cobain responded saying that that she has the same problem people you know complaining that you know she's trying to look like her parents and it was kind of interesting you know because you look like who you look like and a lot of people look kind of like their parents you know what i mean and uh it, it's uh you know julian sort of uh people were talking about how he sounds like john and you know your voice is your voice and and he sounds like john and sean sounds a bit like john too but, you know, people complaining that you look like them or you're going out of your way to look like them. It, it just seemed kind of silly, but it just seems like one of these things that, um, you know, we probably haven't thought about what the children of famous people who go on to make their own careers have to have to deal with from the, uh, you know, the the commenter sphere out there. Mm. It's part of your DNA. You can't, <laughs> you can't do anything about it. So, yeah. you know thing is with sean he definitely is the combination face wise of john and yoko yeah whereas julian is more he looks more like john yeah to me anyway mm -hmm. but so now we'll talk okay. about the fest darren you can okay get that kicking all right well um the uh 2019 new york new jersey fest for beatles fans took place uh last weekend is it yes been a <laughs> uh boy uh, when you get old, you have no concept of time anymore. But um, the 2019 Fest for Beatles fans took place uh, um, uh, in Jersey City at the Hyatt, uh, located right on the Hudson River in Jersey City, across from Lower Manhattan. And as usual, you hear the whole, you hear this all the time. A splendid time was had by all, and it was the case again this year. I have felt in recent years perhaps the guest list 
was thinning a little bit, but boy, this year, Beatles Fest made a big time comeback with um, Alan White of Yes, the drummer of Yes, who also, before he was in Yes, played drums with uh, John in the Plastic Ono Band. He was on All Things Must Pass as well and joined Yes, replacing Bill Bruford in 1972 and is still with Yes today, although his health has pretty much robbed him of the ability to play more than just a couple of tracks, a couple of songs uh, live. But Alan White was there, which was great. The Zombies showed up on Saturday, the day after they were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. The ceremony took place Friday night in New York City at where? Bar- at, where did it happen? I what think it's called? Barclays. I think it's Barclays. It was Bar- well, it was in New York City Friday, and on Saturday afternoon they stopped by for approximately 45-minute chat. They did not perform, but it was great having them there. Jack Douglas, the producer of Double Fantasy, who has also worked on other projects, uh, going as far back as the tail end of the uh, Imagine sessions. Um, he was involved in the final stages of, of putting that album together and worked with Yoko also uh, on some of her mid-70s albums, Double Fantasy, of course, and is still connected to the Beatles. And it was a, a reunion of former Wings members, Denny Lane making his return to the Fest for Beatles fans. Lawrence Juber uh, was there. You heard Ken mention Lawrence a few minutes back. Lawrence uh, revealed that there was a new album coming. In fact, he had it. Uh, for fest attendees and um, Steve Holly was there as well so you had really three fifths of the final wings lineup there um, I realized after the fact that they had also announced that Jack Oliver who had uh, who was worked with Apple Records was going to be a guest but he was not there it must have been a last minute cancellation mm. also on board was Mark Rivera uh, Billy Joel Saxman and of course uh, Ringo Starr, Saxman, and the All Star Band for a while. Uh, Mark Rivera, pretty much uh, playing with Billy Joel now, I guess, as a full time gig with Billy playing the Garden, and um, so he hasn't been on tour with Ringo in recent years. But Mark Rivera was there, of course. Liverpool, which is kind of like the Beatlefest house band, mm-hmm. uh, performed and had the guests joining them, and there was a whole slew, as, as always, of authors and other uh, people who have dedicated themselves to the Beatles. So, And uh, Ken and I were there. Unfortunately, Alan was not there. And Ken and I were amongst uh, a good number of uh, quote-unquote experts who did panels throughout the course of uh, the two and a half days. And uh, I had the pleasure of being up on the main stage on Friday night. I got to chat with some of the guest authors and other special guests. Uh, and then uh, had, had the opportunity to talk with Alan White, Jack Douglas, Denny Lane, and Lawrence Juber for a little over an hour, perhaps an hour and 15 minutes. We had a session, and then uh, I co-hosted the Friday night dance party on the main stage after that, so I was pretty much in the main ballroom uh, all of Friday night, and then Ken was around through the weekend. We were on a couple of panels together on Saturday and Sunday. I was on another panel Saturday night. Very hard to gauge attendance, especially if you've come to the, if you've attended the fest in New York, well, in New Jersey, all these years, you kind of got, we got used to being at a hotel in Secaucus, uh, and you kind of over the years learn what a busy, well-attended fest looked like in the hallways and in the parking garage, so I didn't really get a gauge on what attendance was like. Friday was light, but I think uh, the weekend uh, was pretty well attended. And it was a great weekend. We had a good time. And I know if you go to the Fests, at least their Facebook page, probably their website, too, there's all kinds of photos up there of uh, the guests and performances and whatnot. Okay. Can I give a quick summary for me? Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Uh, a lot of highlights. That's it. Weekend. Time's up. Uh, <laughs> definitely Saturday night at uh, the end of the night when Liverpool – uh, backed up the three wings guys and they did about half of back to the egg which i was very surprised because usually whenever any of the members of wings especially the last lineup if they ever attend the fest you'll get rock extra out of them you'll get getting closer but uh they did again and again and again old siam sir spin it on we're open tonight so glad to see you here and they sounded great 
And Glenn Burtnick, I got to give him a lot of credit, as I do everybody in Liverpool. Glenn handled uh, the McCartney vocals so well. He's got such a strong voice, and you need it for those rockers. But that was a killer show. And uh, all the shows that Lawrence Schubert gave, there was the, the Wings reunion I just mentioned. He did a solo show on uh, Saturday uh, afternoon upstairs. Um, there's a, there was a small uh, stage there where he did just acoustic numbers, and he was fantastic. Did a similar show the next day in the main ballroom, and it's it's a it's a thrill to watch him perform because he's just so great on guitar. I mean, he's one of the best guitarists I've ever seen, and you always catch people around you who haven't seen him live, and they're just wowed by him. They can't believe that he's that good. They know his name because of the Wings Association, but they don't know how great a guitarist he really is. So that's part of the fun of seeing him live. Uh, our good friend John Montagna, who was yes. a guest here on this show, he did, and you were with me, Darren, he did his own clinic on Paul as a bass player, and he walked you through some of what Paul was doing on songs like Come Together and Something, and uh, the Abbey Road medley. At the end, he explained why what he was doing was so innovative, and comparing that to what each member of the Beatles were doing on each song and how it all fit how they all collaborated together and were locked in, in particular the bass and the, and the drumming. And it was fascinating. In fact, there's a video online of, of John talking about Paul's bass playing on something, and you should see it. It's edited very well, explains why his bass playing on that song was so fantastic, as well as the whole album, and explaining, as he did on our show, why Paul deserves so much credit as a great bass player. That was a definite highlight for me. And of course, I thought that, all I the thought panels... Let me just jump in quick. I thought John's pro, uh, performance, his session was fantastic. And I told him afterwards that, you know, it just, uh, I thought it was thrilling. So just wanted to add that and thumbs up to John. Yeah. And I hope we have him back on the show soon because we got a great response from that show. And, uh, and then there are the panels that uh, I was a part of, the one with you, Darren. And we had a topic, which was something you were thinking about doing for a while about the different mixes on Beatles releases and are you are you okay with this coming out? Is it like a revisionism of any kind and how do fans feel about that? And so we got a great reaction to that. I did a panel with the Talk More Talk co host with Kid O'Toole and, and Ken Womack. The the subject was called Sing the Changes and it's all about the Beatles and their solo careers and how they adapted to different changes in uh, musical styles that were going on from disco to dance music, getting into electronica, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that was interesting. And then we had a Beatles media panel, which was fantastic. And I had no idea how that panel was going to go, what direction we were going to go into. And Wally Pedrasic was a great moderator for that. Just talking about the media today, the Beatles media, and is there so much information out there, so many shows? I mean, think about it. There's so many podcasts now on the Beatles, group or solo. Is it too much information? Do we benefit from it? You know, questions like that. And how important podcasts are now? Very interesting conversation. And I had a blast talking to all the fans of both my podcast shows and every little thing. So I spent a lot of time talking to the fans. And that was, a, you know, a very big part. Of, of the weekend and thanks to everyone that attended and uh, came to see our shows, our, our panel discussions, because we really appreciate it. Yeah, we, we, I mean, those are fun. And it's always uh, it's always cool when you've got a receptive audience and who are engaged and interested in what you have to say. Um, you know, I was I was pretty passionate about the the panel you and I did, Ken, which Alan would have been on if Alan was able to make it this year. Who We would have made it a full all the hosts of things we said today together that I, you know, I found myself actually, um, I felt like I was beginning to really go in circles with, but the folks came back afterwards and says, no, that was a great conversation uh, about, you know, the reinvention of Beatle music, you know, by remixing it and the good, the bad. And, 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 and we did talk about some of the ugly too. It was, it was, maybe we'll do it as a topic uh, here uh, on the podcast, perhaps later in the year when, it's fairly obvious that Abbey Road will be coming out as a deluxe uh, set for the anniversary. And that's, I would think, it's safe bet to say there's going to be a new 2019 mix by Giles Martin in that one. 
So that could be a topic for a future show. Mm -hmm. Okay. Main topic now, Darren. <laughs> main topic. All right. Well, we have a main topic, folks, that we planned out beforehand. Uh, and, um, you know, as I've pointed out a couple of times uh, since I've joined the show uh, in September, the majority of these podcasts, things we said today, have been centered around uh, specific releases. The Imagine Box, uh, Egypt Station, the White Album, etc. cetera. Uh, so it's fun to kind of, you know, grab a random thought and uh, do a show that's kind of like the three of us sitting around, throwing back a few and talking with you about some of our favorite uh, songs, records, etc. So that's what we're going to do today and zero in on singles, specifically standalone singles. Now, for the sake of those of you who may not have heard that expression or don't know what a standalone single is. These are singles that were released independent of an album. So it wasn't a case where a song was lifted from an album as a single. It's the single from Revolver. This is a song, and it's, uh, uh, in most cases, it's B-side that, that are standalone, standing without having to support an album or announce a forthcoming album, or to try to, uh, you know, stretch out the sales of an album by coming out at some point in the future. So that would be the topic we'd like to get into right now, talk about ours, and then, of course, after you listen to the show, absolutely share with us via email or the Facebook page your thoughts on favorite Beatles standalone singles and solo Beatles standalone singles. Again, singles that are independent of albums and one thing that i when we were planning this that i mentioned was that in the case of say for example something like strawberry fields forever and penny lane that would qualify as a standalone single even though it initially those two songs were going to be on sergeant pepper once they were removed released as singles they were removed from uh contention and thus were not part of sergeant pepper and then on the other side of the coin there's a single like All You Need Is Love with Baby or a Rich Man on the B-side. Two songs that were not intended to be on an album. They were, from the beginning, songs targeted to be released as A and B-side of a single. Yet in the United States and some other countries, some six months later, both songs turned up as part of Magical Mystery Tour. In that case, in my opinion, All You Need Is Love would still qualify as a standalone single because it's inclusion on on album was done not by the band but by one of the record companies involved in releasing their music and it was done after the fact so hopefully that made sense and now that i've pretty much tried to lay down the groundwork of what a standalone single is we're going to share our favorites uh with you and then uh, hopefully you uh will throw yours our way uh so uh, alphabetical order. We'll start with Alan. Put him on the spot, and let's hear uh, Alan your uh, favorites. Now, Ken did put a limit on the number of uh, singles we could pick, and I decided I wasn't going to listen to Ken. Uh, <laughs> what else is new? <laughs> but I did a, a kind of like a, a, a rough around Ken's initial plan: three Beatles singles, five solo Beatles singles, all four Beatles collectively in that five. So let's see what you came up with, uh, Alan. Yeah, so see, we're, just, we're just doing the Beatles stuff first, right? The group stuff? Okay, yeah, let's do it like that. Okay. Um, yeah, you see, I didn't understand the math um, when Ken, when Ken <laughs> explained it, so I just thought we had to pick, uh, you know, one Beatles single and one of each, and then it, it, at one point Ken said, well, you don't have to have one of each. You could, you know, it could be three of Paul and whatever. In which case, I would naturally have gravitated towards making them all Beatles solo singles, standalone singles. But nevertheless, um, trying to give the solo careers their due, I, I had picked basically one Beatles single and one from each of them. But I could easily do five Beatles singles if you want, um, if we're going to start with the Beatles. Okay. Uh, because the thing is, um, you know, in the UK, I mean, basically, you know, Darren was explaining that what what a standalone single is, and in the UK, they were mostly standalone singles because they had this policy of not 
having the single on the album because they felt that um, if you went and bought the single and then you went and bought the album, you were paying again for two songs that you had already paid for. And uh, obviously there were some some exceptions. I mean, Hard Day's Night pretty much had to be on the Hard Day's Night album, and Can't Buy Me Love, since it was in the film, had to be on, on Hard Day's Night album. Uh, same with Help. But in the UK, most of their singles were standalone, and uh, I would say that my top one would be Strawberry Fields' Penny Lane. I mean, that single just always amazes me. Uh, it, it, it never go, gets old. Strawberry Fields especially. I mean, you know, we've talked about it before uh, on the show here uh, quite a lot, so I don't want to necessarily re- repeat myself, but there is so much going on in that song. It was such a different song from anything the Beatles had done before, the sort of uh, imagery and the lyrics, the sounds, which um, took them, you know, they put a lot of work into getting, and John was not was not pleased with any of the individual versions they did and you've got that joining at the one minute mark of of two of the three versions that the Beatles recorded somehow works and sounds natural and uh, and then Penny Lane you know it's, it was similar I mean it's a more conventional song in that the lyrics are really straightforward you know you're you're getting a picture of of, of the Penny Lane area, uh, the roundabout, the barbershop, still there, as we know from the uh, James Corden interview with Paul during this last summer. And you just get, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it paints a picture, whereas Strawberry Fields is more philosophical and a bit spacey, and uh, you've got sentences in there that really need to be parsed to figure out what he's actually saying, if you can, you know. And musically, though, Penny Lane has, you know, a lot going on because that you wouldn't have known until, say, the anthology came out and and, um, gave us some of the outtakes. And you realize that the basis of that sound is keyboards overlaid, you know, and and then the other things put on the trumpet and, you know, the the other instruments. And uh, it's they're they're both just magical. Um, should I come up with four other Beatles singles? I would think you could do it off the top of your head. Well, I, I can. <laughs> okay. Well, originally, I said three Beatles singles, five solos. So now you're saying five Beatles singles. Okay. It doesn't really matter to me. Okay, but... three Beatles singles. Okay. So just to sort of ad lib two other Beatles singles, um, just off the top of my head, I mean, I would go to Paperback Writer and Rain as my next one. Paperback writer, you know, again, pretty straightforward storyline. Um, people say that it is Paul writing about John in a as a paperback writer since John put out some some books. But it's, it doesn't have to be about John. I mean, it, in fact, John never wrote for the Daily Mail. And, uh, you know, so it, it's it, it, let's say it's a fictional character um, who wants to be a paperback writer, very straightforward, but musically you got a lot going on incredible bass line incredible bass line on both those songs the opening choral yeah. part that the that they do together you know as the intro to the song um and the fact that it's got so much energy i mean the recording is i believe in that case sped up a little bit they they recorded it a bit slower and it's sped up, which uh, is a you know fairly standard production technique, not sped up an awful lot, but it, it just gives it a lot of energy. And uh, you know, there's great guitar playing in it. And uh, on Rain, you have not only you know interesting guitar playing; um, it, it sounds like almost bagpipey in a way, you know. Uh, but you've got again another incredible bass line. You've got great drumming from Ringo. John singing it. I mean, he's heading towards Strawberry Fields in this song in a way. It's that kind of laconic, uh, you know, when the rain comes, it's fine with me. I don't care. And uh, then you've got the backwards bit at the end, which was, um, I think, the first time they did that. So that's a, a pretty innovative single. And for a third, 
Uh, I have a vague sense that Darren might do um, All You Need Is Love and Baby or Rich Man. Um, so I will go backwards and do We Can Work It Out and Day Tripper. Because it, in a certain way, I don't even know if I can really say I have favorites among Beatles singles. I mean, I, I, I think in a way that Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane is my favorite. But there is not a bad single among the Beatles output and uh you know they're all incredibly special recordings in a way and and uh they could have fit on the albums in the u.s they often were on the albums but they're they're sort of like interesting calling cards that extend the british album by another two tracks uh we can work it out in day trippers from the rubber soul period and, you know, there again, you've got a sort of, we can work it out. It, it's it's uh, that one. In that one, Paul is actually kind of philosoph <laughs> philosophical um, with the middle eight from John extending that, you know, life is very short and there's no time for fussing and fighting. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, a, a great thing to put in there in the middle of this upbeat, you know, try to see it my way, we can work it out song and then day tripper uh you know the guitar riff is john's and uh it's some people have said it's about drugs uh you know who the hell knows probably more likely than not <laughs> but even if you're looking at it from a totally innocent point of view and thinking of you know day tripper as a, you know just someone who's sort of you know in and out of the picture it works too has a lot of energy, has that interesting riff uh, that that really is ear catching and, and stays with you. And uh, yeah, so those would be my three. All um, right. Oh, I got. I'm always writing them down, and I'm listening to you, and forgot to write down. We can work it out. So there's Alan Strawberry Fields Forever, Penny Lane, first single, second single, Paperback Rider with Rain, third one, We Can Work It Out with Day Tripper. Day Tripper was the B side on that one, I think. Yep. Was it? Yep. Okay. Yep. Which is amazing the amount when you're researching this and you see songs, some of the singles are considered double A side. And I never totally understood what constituted a single that had a double, that was a double A sided single and what was an A side and a B side. But to some of the songs that ended up on the B side of Beatles singles are classics. And it's, these are songs that some bands wish would be their only single that they would have the opportunity to release in their, <laughs> in their careers. And here the Beatles have tossed them on B-sides. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I just want to say it's kind of muddy when you're talking about A-sides and B-sides because a double A-side to me are, are singles where both sides charted separately and both sides got a lot of airplay, as they were with a lot of Beatles singles. But, you know, I, I will always think of We Can Work It Out, Day Tripper as a double A-side. Right. You think of something come together as a double A side. But like in America, would you think I want to hold your hand? I saw her standing there as a double A side. I don't know. You know, some people think of I saw her standing there as a B side. But well, they, they will always say, um, uh, you know, to jump briefly to the solo stuff that George's first single, My Sweet Lord. And isn't it a pity was a double A side. And it seemed like it was a pre-planned it was pre-planned to release the two songs together for them to get equal attention, I guess. Yeah, uh, I mean, some of them are actually promoted as double A sides. Like when the single goes out to the radio station, it, it's it you know they they the company says it's double A side. And with Apple, once they went to Apple from Capital, it became easy because you could tell it was a double A side because both sides had the green apple on it. But I never understood that well, I was too young. Uh, I mean, that, in that case of My Sweet Lord, I was five when that came out. So I don't remember how it was handled on AM radio, you know, how they handled playing those um, those two songs and dealt with them being on the charts at the same time and whatnot. But um, anyway, that's a topic for another show. Yeah, it can that, get confusing. It really yeah. can. Right. But right. Um, there are a lot of B-sides of singles that charted that didn't chart well. I mean, the inner light, for example, you wouldn't call that a double A side with Lady Madonna. No. So I guess it's a B side, even though it charted. So right. like I said, it's a little confusing. Uh, but one of my choices was the ballad of John and Yoko and old brown shoe. 
I really come to love the Ballad of John and Yoko more and more through the years. I think that song, the recording of that song, has such presence to it. And it's funny how, as a kid growing up, I always thought, as most of us did, that it was all four Beatles on that record. And then later on, you learn it was just John and Paul. But I love the playing on it. I love Paul's drumming. I love Paul's bass playing. I love the harmonies between John and Paul. They just worked together so well on that song. And it told a great story about John and Yoko getting married and all that they went through at that time, all in a three-minute song. And that's part of the brilliance of so many songs the Beatles have given us that they say so much in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. And I love Old Brown Shoe a lot. That's another song that has grown on me through the years. I always loved it, but I love it so much more now. It's such such a solid rocker that you don't really get the song that isn't given that much credit through the years, and it deserves to be. It really is a good blues rock song, and I love the, the bass line that George Harrison played in the song. Everything about it, the piano playing, it's so driving, it's so pumping. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it, there's, there's so much energy on that record. And to think that it was strictly a B-side, you know, a lot of these B-sides that the Beatles had could have been A-sides for anybody else. Yep. And uh, Old Brown Shoe is just one of many that I could say that about. So I would also include in there Penny Lane, Strawberry Fields Forever. I can't really add too much to what Alan said about it, except that there was so much invention on Strawberry Fields Forever. And when you when you learn about all the work that was put into that song, from take one through all the different takes, and even just hearing take seven, which is great by itself, you know, when you add the two takes that they edited together and you think about everything, all the work that George Martin did with the orchestration, for example, the drumming is so phenomenal. <laughs> You know, um, the instrumentation that was used in, in, in that particular song, the dreamy quality of it. Just like like Alan said, there was nothing like that before with the Beatles, uh, with that feel to it. Penny Lane is, without a doubt, like the perfect pop song. It's three minutes of perfection. You don't get any better than Penny Lane. Melodically, everything that was put into it. Again, George Martin deserves so much credit for what he did in the arrangement, the brass section the piccolo trumpet everything and you know it's it, it's it's the tops as far as writing a pop song is concerned and telling a story at the same time and then i'd have to say hey jude and revolution i don't know how it's possible to even top hey jude as a song although you know the beatles catalog is loaded with so many great recordings it's hard to say which is the best or which is your favorite but um everything about hey jude is wonderful the melody paul's vocals Everything about the band and, and leading into the um, nanas and the screaming at the end. And, um, you know, there's a reason why that song was number one for nine weeks. You know, it's, um, it's simply an amazing record. And Revolution is one of the best rockers the Beatles ever gave us. It's everything that they put into their, to their songs there. The musicianship, every part they played was right. Those are my favorite singles overall. You know, it's it's sometimes it's hard to do, to explain why these songs are so great because we all know they're great, <laughs> and we've been living with them for fifty years and recognizing their greatness and appreciating it even more as time goes on. But when you think about all they put into their music, in the songwriting, in the musicianship, in the production, you know, these were just three of their best singles, standalone singles, that is in my opinion. And what does the bird have to say? <laughs> it can Who's sing. by a window? <laughs> <laughs> and what are yours, Darren? Well, uh, I picked five, and I can keep it brief because there are some, there's actually what I expected. There's repetition, and I really can't uh, elaborate any better than uh, the, uh, the two of you did with your picks. Uh, I put them in order of release, starting May 1966, Paperback Rider with Rain is the B-side. To me, that is the perfect power pop single, period. That is perfection when it comes to jangly guitars and everything the power pop is. It all goes to that single, Paperback Rider and Rain. Next up, it's actually impossible to do this without... Strawberry Fields Forever with Penny Lane. 
I think that's A and B or double A, as we were saying, from February 67. Next up from March 68, Lady Madonna with the inner light on the B side. Uh, I love the inner light and it's gorgeous. And it also benefits because it's one of the handful of songs that gets very, very little attention. So it always sounds fresh when you hear it. Uh, if, you, if you know what I'm saying, you hear it, your ears perk up because the inner light does not come around all that often. And that was a little gem on the other side of uh, Lady Madonna, March 68, here in the U.S., the last uh, Beatles record uh, issued on the Capitol label before Apple would uh, take over. The first was August 1968, Hey Jude with Revolution, ditto to what Ken said there. And uh, same deal with the ballad of John and Yoko and the B-side George's Old Brown Shoe, which came out late May, early June of 69, what those are my five and i noticed after i picked them but what i essentially did was pick most of the tracks that were on the hey jude album that came out in the u.s and some other countries in february 70 and was the first u.s compilation album collecting together non-album tracks if memory serves correct my first ever beatles album was hey jude i could never I had it came out right around the time I turned five and could never figure out why my label said the Beatles again and the spine said, hey, Jude. Um, <laughs> but still, when I hear Rain, Paperback Rider, Lady Madonna, Hey, Jude, Revolution, Old Brown Shoe, The Ballad of John and Yoko, I could still picture my copy of uh, Hey, Jude spinning on my little phonograph. So perhaps that's why those songs I gravitated to more so than maybe some of the earlier tunes, mm -hmm. uh, early uh, uh, singles. So those are my five uh, and, for Beatles. And for people of the last 30 years that are newer Beatles fans, they would be thinking Past Masters, Volumes 1 and 2. Right. True, yes, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, That's where these all belong. That's where they are, um, right. except for the Magical Mystery Tour singles. Now, if you wanted, if you somebody wanted to really get technical and disagree with some of the ground rules I laid down at the beginning, you could say, "Yeah, but Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane were on Magical Mystery Tour. Uh, all you need is love." They, they were, yes, they were. But again, as I mentioned before, those were albums created not by the band but by a record company. In this case, Magical Mystery Tour, the album was a capital U.S. creation, although it did come out in other countries. So maybe it's not accurate to say it was solely a U.S. capital release. Will initially, um, you you could also. I mean, it raises another problem because you could pick "Hello Goodbye," which came out as a single uh, that was sort of a standalone single. But "I Am the Walrus" was on the side I, of the Magical Mystery Tour album that was actually intended uh, as you know. <laughs> or you that, could say that, that was, all of the Magical Mystery it, Tour stuff is is EPs, and therefore they're right, all right. standalone singles. So. Yeah, but uh, yeah. so that's there's our picks for the Beatles uh, singles. A little overlap there, and actually a lot of overlapping, which to me is no surprise. Can but I now make we'll one do... observation about the the picks generally. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that uh, you know I, I I spent a lot of time listening to the Inner Light when it came out, and also Old Brown Shoe, and especially loved Old Brown Shoe, but but love them both. But you are correct in saying that the inner light didn't get a lot of airplay and, uh, you know, people were strange about it because it was Indian instruments and uh, people didn't know what to make of that at the time, even though by then they'd, you know, already heard some of George's Indian things. It, it really didn't catch on. But I think today people don't have a problem with it at all. And, no, not uh, at all. And it's kind of like it's it's a pity that George didn't live to see this, but his stuff, both in the Beatles and post Beatles, is now getting an awful lot more respect than it used to. Absolutely, um, when he was alive, um, and especially during the Beatles years, um, and it's kind of nice to see. Just yeah, to say unfortunately, mm. so unfortunately, sometimes it takes death to do that. Uh, but hey, better late than never. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So now on to the solo stuff, and I think we probably the three of us probably picked differently. I did get a little confused and went one route. Ken actually said pick five of by the four of them, and 
Alan, I don't know, he was walking walking in circles, perhaps. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so should we do it now? You know what? I'm going to reverse it. I'm going first this time. Okay. With the solo records. What I did was I went individual with each Beatle. And it worked out nicely, except, of course, McCartney tended to do, do this more often than the others, release these standalone singles. So McCartney got a little a little tricky for me to try to pick just two by each. Okay? Now... When it comes to the singles, I was thinking of them as a, a complete entity, A side and B side jointly. If I wasn't crazy for the B side, then the single itself, in my line of thinking, suffered and maybe didn't make my list. Now, we know the case with John's singles, many of them had Yoko on the B side. So, for example, so let's say uh, Power to the People. Here in the U.S., the B side was Touch Me from the Yoko Ono Plastic Ono Band album. And, well, uh, Touch Me is a tough listen. Let's leave it at that. So I was tempted to drop Power to the People from my choice because, again, it's a standalone single. One of my favorite singles, the B-side, carries some weight in that decision-making. But Power to the People was so stinking good. And it has a, a, a very near and dear to my heart because it was released right around the same day that I turned six. And I have vivid memories of repeatedly playing it in a jukebox when I was six on a, a family vacation who had uh, several jukeboxes scattered around the resort, and they all had power to the people in them. And upon returning home from this vacation, my mother bought the single for me and power to the people, which I love the song, goes without saying, but it has a, a personal connection to it that's very strong and pretty much... It overrides my, let's say, disinterest in Touch Me on Yoko's B-side. Hmm. Hmm. Now, for my other pick, I went with Instant Karma, We All Shine On. Not only is it an anthem, it's a classic Lennon track, quintessential Lennon track, one of many. But the B-side, Yoko's song, uh, which is um, Who Has Seen the Wind. Oh, I, I confused myself. I'm reading my notes wrong. Okay, no, I'm okay. I'm okay here. What I did was I did John two different ways. I picked strong A-sides and then sing two singles where the B-side counted as well. So for my strong A-side, I went with Power to the People and Instant Karma, We All Shine On. And for complete John Yoko singles, I picked Instant Karma, We All Shine On with Yoko's Who Has Seen the Wind on the B, which is actually a pretty good song. Mm -hmm. And I also went then with Happy Christmas War is Over, which had another rather lovely Yoko song, Listen, the Snow is Falling on the B-side. So uh, so my complete John singles, Happy Christmas War is Over, with Listen, the Snow is Falling on the B, and uh, Instant Karma, We All Shine On with Who Has Seen the Wind on the B-side, and ignoring the B-sides, the two strongest A-sides, I went with Power to the People, and also, I also picked Instant Karma, We All Shine On. Uh, on to Paul. Uh, this was very tough for me to narrow it down to two, but I went both with Wing Singles, Junior's Farm, with Sally G on the B. And that was a case where it wasn't an a, a double A side, but Sally G had some legs in country radio. And mm -hmm. I do believe there was a point in early 75 when the single was re-released with Sally G on the whole green apple side and Junior's Farm on the cut open white apple B side. But uh, ori originally released in the October of 74 from Paul McCartney and Wings, Junior's Farm and Sally G. And my other pick is Mull of Kintyre, a classic McCartney song, if there ever was one, and one of his great rockers, Girls School on the B side. U.S. radio tended to want to flip the single uh, and pay more attention to the B side. Uh, maybe the confusion of preferring the B-side to Mull of Kintyre caused the single to stall here in the U.S., but Mull of Kintyre was a massive hit worldwide, and it came out in November of 77. So those are my two McCartney picks, with honorable mentions to Mary Had a Little Lamb and a Little Woman Love, Another Day, and No Woman, No Why, and Live and Let Die, and I Lie Around. Those are honorable mentions, um, those three. And then to George, George was easy. There was only one, Bangladesh, with Deep Blue on the B-side. 
There aren't any other standalone George Harrison singles. Uh, if yes, there count, are. If you count Cheer Down and Poor Little Girl. Album tracks from the soundtrack to uh, uh, Lethal Weapon 2, and in the U.S., Cheer Down's B-side was a track from Cloud Nine. No. Wasn't it Poor Little Girl? That's what I thought, but when I was looking this up, I will pull it up for a second, but uh, I'll just continue. Bangladesh and Deep Blue was my George pick. I was thinking. I was thinking. There's. I don't want to do it. With uh, from the Porky's Revenge soundtrack. I was yes. taking literal standalone single, not connected to any album. See what I'm saying? Right. Uh, so but if you were, say not connected to any George album, that's different. True. Exactly. So <laughs> it made it easier for me to narrow it down with George to go. All right. Cheer Down would have been a no-brainer. In fact, Cheer Down might have been my number one pick. Because I think it's that great of a George song. But then I was looking at it going, yeah, but it was a single off Lethal Weapon 2 soundtrack, therefore, comma, it technically doesn't fit with my criteria, and I don't want to do it. The same thing. Single from Porky's Revenge with, a, with another artist on the B-side from the soundtrack, Dave Edmonds. So I ended up just leaving it Bangladesh Deep Blue, and I want to try to find here, while I'm talking at the same time, the uh, situation would cheer down. But so while I'm looking, I will uh, go over to Ringo. Uh, Ringo didn't do many of those either. And I think we're all going to probably pick the same ones. It's possible um, it don't come easy. Mm-hmm. It is uh, with early 1970 on the B side. It's possible that's one of the best singles by the four of them. Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, sure. and and then I, I've always thought so highly of Back Off Boogaloo that it, I ignore the fact that it, Blind Man, which is a dud, is on the B-side of that <laughs> single. And on the strength of Back Off Boogaloo alone, also there's not much competition there because, again, Ringo didn't release, I don't think, any others. There might be a technicality that someone could come up with, but... There are, some, no. there are some B-sides from, uh, like, Time Take Time. I think I might have done, you know, some old rockers, and uh, I can't remember offhand. But there there were some things that were on Japanese single, Japanese CD singles uh, that weren't on anything else. I no, think as far as, as far as an A-side to a single, no. Don't Go Where the Road Don't Go was, a, I believe, a Japanese or a German single. Mm-hmm. And and the flip side was a song called um, Everyone Wins, which wasn't on Time Takes Time. Right. But as far as an A-side from an album, it was already on Time, time Takes Time. Wasn't there also a you know, Blue Suede Shoes or Heartbreak Hotel or something? I can't remember what it was, but there was an oldie that he included as one of those Japanese Oh, pieces. oh, oh. Uh, he did "Don't Be Cruel," which right. was uh, one. It was a bonus track on the CD single for "Way to the World," yeah. but then "Way to the World" was on "Time Takes Time." Yeah, you know, you reach a certain age, you begin to forget <laughs> things. And the other thing that also makes it confusing is once the CD hit, and the CD caught on, and people started buying the CDs, and vinyl slowly phased out. Cassettes survived a little while. And they even had some some success with the single, if you remember those. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, the lines between an A-side, B-sides, non-album tracks, is this a single or an EP, really blurred, which kind of changed the whole complexion of what a true single was in the classic sense of the word. Now, while you guys um, talk about, and I guess we should go to Ken next uh, for the solo stuff, first little bit of info I'm checking here. This says, and I will search further because the more I think about it, I think Alan is right about Cheer Down. But this source I'm looking at says that's what it takes is the B-side in the U.S. Poor Little Girl is the B-side in the U.K. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we'll go to Ken and I will continue to dig around. Ken, your picks? Okay. Well, as our listeners will be able to figure out, we each made our own set of rules. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I Power wanted to, the to keep simple. <laughs> <laughs> I just said three Beatles singles, five solo singles, and I stipulated you don't have to make sure that there's one from each Beatle in the solo. If if you wanted them all to be Paul singles, that's fine. And oh, was that, the, that was in the email I deleted, wasn't it? I'm probably, kidding. I'm, yeah. I'm just joking. I'm joking. And, and also, when you're dealing with, as you said, Darren, in the case of George, you really just have Bangladesh. And in the case of Ringo, you have it don't come easy and, and back off Boogaloo. 
there's not that much to pick from. So if you're going to pick one from each, you don't have that, that much of a choice there. But anyway, these are the five that I came up with. I'm going to start with Good Night Tonight and Daytime Nighttime Suffering. Good I thanks. love Good Night Tonight because it's just a, a really unique dance track. Whether you consider it disco or not, there's no other song in that genre in dance music or in disco that sounds anything like Good Night Tonight. Starting off with that real Spanish guitar sounding uh, introduction and uh, one of Paul's best bass lines on record. And I love the hook on it. And it's just such a unique song. It's a song that's all Paul's own. And I've always loved Good Night Tonight. And then the flip side, Daytime Nighttime Suffering, is definitely a favorite amongst fans of uh, Paul's B-sides. It's got uh, great melody, great harmonies, great hooks. And uh, I know a lot of people that wish that either both those songs or or um, many feel Daytime Nighttime Suffering should have been on Back to the Egg. But uh, both those songs back-to-back are killer songs. I also put in there a Don't Come Easy and Early 1970. What can I say about it, Don't Come Easy? It has stood the test of time. It is just a great three-minute pop song. Great production from George. Uh, great guitar playing from George. Uh, the message in the song is great. And you can tell that Ringo has always been proud of the song because he keeps on quoting, got to pay your dues if you want to sing the blues in so many of his songs. And early 1970 is a great little nod to the other three Beatles, an affectionate nod to them. And uh, if you're a Beatle fan, how can you not enjoy Ringo writing about the other Beatles this way? Um, I had to include Instant Karma, which to me is like one of the greatest singles from the Beatles group and solo cat and combined. Everything about it is exciting. And when you, you hear what John said, and it's a great quote, although not totally accurate. You know, I wrote it for breakfast. I recorded it for lunch. I put it out for dinner. He didn't do all that in one day, but it certainly has that feel of immediacy to it. And um, I love the whole sound of it. It's such a great hook. The vocals are absolutely amazing. I love the production from Phil Spector. It's uh, everything you can wish for in a great rock, rock track that's a John Lennon single. And as a B-side, I love Yoko Suessi in the Wind. Very pretty melody, very oriental flavor to it. And it's proof that Yoko, when she wants to, can write really nice melodies, which she is not known for because all the media ever shows us is when she's screaming, which is only a part of what she does. But um, anyone who, who has heard that song, as well as Listen, The Snow Is Falling, that's proof right there of beautiful melodies that Yoko has come up with. So I love Instant Karma and Who Has Seen the Wind. And uh, I tell you, this is another song that I appreciate so much more now than I ever did, although I have always loved this song, is Another Day. Another Day is another example of a perfect pop song. It's also yeah. well-constructed. The melody is fantastic. I love Paul's bass line in there, especially when he's singing the do-do-do-do-do-do part that... Uh, that bass line that he does while that's going on, a very busy bass line. And um, it's just everything about it, the guitar playing, the lead guitar part, the way it ends, that particular finish there with the last note rising, everything about it, it's such a fine piece of work. And, um, and the flip side, A Woman O.Y. is one of those great raw rock and roll songs from Paul. And, uh, you know, that's the kind of song that a lot of fans crave he would do more of with those kind of vocals. And a uh, great edge to it. And, uh, I mean, it's so easy nowadays to associate those two songs with Ram since they were recorded at the same time as Ram. But it was great. You know, I kind of, um, I feel sorry for fans, later fans, that don't grow up with these songs as singles and as standalone singles. And if they get into this music, they know it more for being a song from Ram or from the remastered box set or songs on compilations because, you know, they have an identity all their own as standalone singles. And it's been so much fun as a Beatle fan to follow that, the group years and the solo years, that for some brief period of time, they put out a song that was just released as a single, no tie into anything else. 
and it has an identity and a life all its own just as that and um to start off his solo career with this as his first single although i'm sure just about everybody will feel that maybe i'm amazed should have been a single this was a great choice it's perfection at its best you know along the same lines as penny lane to me and then my favorite has to be a song that you mentioned darren and that's Junior's Farm and Sally G. Junior's Farm is a great rock song from Paul. Doesn't get the kind of airplay that it once did. Certainly deserves it. I love the plotting bass line. I love Paul's vocals in it. Everything, the guitar parts, the way that it ends so cool with Paul taking a breath at the very end. Such a cool ending there to that song. And uh, the flip side, Sally G, is Paul doing a country song. And it's perfect the way that's pulled off. Everything about it, very clever use of the lyrics there. You took the part that was the heart of me, Sally G. I never thought to ask her what the letter G stood for, but I, I, I knew for sure it wasn't good. It's very clever. Everything about that song. I wish Paul would do more in the country field, but Paul likes to dabble here and there and do a song in this genre and a song in that genre, with the exception of Kisses on the Bottom. Um, you won't see him do an album of all country songs or an album of all jazz songs or anything like that. But um, I, I do wish he'd do more in the country field. But those are two perfect songs when you think about an A-side and a B-side that uh, really work well. Although Sally G did chart, like you said, Darren, on the country charts. I'm glad that it got some recognition at the time. But uh, now I love Junior's Farm. I love that particular song to death. I just, uh, I never get tired of hearing it. Just, uh, you know, an absolute great rocker. Very quickly, before we go to you, Alan, how many of you listening would get annoyed when the DJ would talk before Paul went, uh, at the end yep. of June Farm? Oh, yeah. Or they, or they cut it off. The, the songs yeah. die, or it gets cut off. You have to play the whole thing. Mm. And uh, the other thing, which I never knew about until Wingspan came out, that they actually did an edit that only was released for promotional purposes, a promo yeah. single, and they used the edit, I guess, for completers, completists, having the edit was a nice thing to collect. But when I listen to Wingspan, I always feel like, why didn't they just leave the full version? Hmm. Uh, it's not like or, that song was too long to begin right, with. Right, Exactly. Uh, I, before Alan, before you go, I did double check, and uh, the B side of Cheers, Cheer Down in the U.S. is in fact that's what it takes from Cloud Nine. So that's in the U.S., the B side was cl a Cloud Nine track. So that was not the case in the U.K. It was Poor Little Girl. Okay. And now it's time for Alan Cozen. Okay. So, you know, I'm more of a group guy than a solo guy, so my list is a bit shorter, but, uh, you know, there are, like Ken says, a lot to choose from with Paul and uh, uh, comparatively little from the others. Uh, for John, I would take Cold Turkey and Don't Worry Kyoko. Cold Turkey is, you know, he wrote it for a reason, and he wrote it to document, as, as a lot of things on plastic ono band you know to document his pain about various things in this case going off drugs and you know it, it, it musically i mean the guitar parts are just uh you know perfect for the subject and the the uh so just sort of pounding backing and john's vocal on it uh is is really incredible it's i think a great song that is overlooked a lot of the time just because i think people are uncomfortable with the subject matter i think you know john i think offered it to the beatles as a potential single and they were uncomfortable with it mm -hmm. um so put it out on his own and uh it's 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 really a great recording. Don't worry, Kyoko as well is, um, you know, that is Yoko in her sort of driving rocker uh, uh, phase. Uh, there's there's a bit of that on Yoko Ono, Plastic Ono Band too. John used to in the comparatively few performances he did um, used to like going from Cold Turkey into Don't Worry, Kyoko, uh, and there is a rehearsal tape of them rehearsing for the one-to-one -one concert um, in which Yoko actually objects to this. You know, she says, what, why does Cold Turkey always have to go into Don't Worry Kyoko? I don't like that. So, but, you know, I mean, he didn't have a, 
a, a vast concert career, so there are comparatively few examples. But uh, anyway, so that's that's John. I, I agree. Instant Karma and Who Has Seen the Wind is a, is a really great single for all the reasons that were said. So I, I don't need to repeat that. For George, yes, again, you you've basically got uh, Bangladesh and Deep Blue. Bangladesh, you know, I mean, uh, I remember when that came out and I went to that concert and um, it was sort of interesting having a topical song. I mean, you know, John wrote Instant Karma saying, you know, you, well, as you said, you know, wrote it for breakfast, put, mixed it for, recorded it for lunch and put it out for dinner. I mean, his idea was that songs could be journalism in a way they could deal with a hot issue, get out real quick. Well, that's what Bangladesh was too, you know, he heard about the, the, the sort of uh, devastation in Bangladesh, which had just recently broken away from Pakistan, and uh, it wasn't pretty. And and he wrote about how there needed to be help for that. I mean, even before the, the concert was announced, I think the single was out. And uh, so it was probably one of the earliest charity singles, you know, in a way. I mean way before We Are the World, you know? Uh, and Deep Blue, the B-side, uh, sort of a, you know, we were talking about Old Brown Shoe as a, a great little blues track. This, too, it's an unusual blues track, and it's, uh, you know, got a nice acoustic texture, really good slide part. I, I actually may have played that side more than Bangladesh when the single came out. Mm. So, on to Paul. That's a little tough, you know, because uh, I'm tempted to include partly because it hasn't been included by either of you, um, Give Ireland Back to the Irish, uh, Wings' first single. This, too, was one of those, you know, songwriting as journalism things. I mean, Paul wrote it quickly over a weekend, recorded it a few days later, and uh, you know, it was banned by the BBC. It was banned by it was banned by a lot of places, including, um, as uh, Adrian Sinclair and I found out in researching our uh, uh, McCartney legacy book, it was banned by a chain, uh, to a couple of chains of record stores, including one that was actually owned by EMI. We can't figure out what the point of that was. Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, you know, um, EMI was very touchy about putting that single out and, uh, you know... They sort of suggested to Paul that maybe it wouldn't be a great idea, and he said, no, this, this is important to me, and I want to have a say about this. Now, he wrote that song the same day John wrote... Um, the Luck either, of the Irish? Yeah, or possibly uh, Sunday Bloody Sunday. Um, hmm. I mean, those, those two were the same, about the same thing but john's didn't john didn't get his out you know for all his talk of journalism and uh, you know instantly getting out he didn't get his out until sometime in new york uh, quite a while later and for paul this was also i think a special single because john had been right before this single came out john had really been taunting him about the granny music and being conservative and not taking chances and and this was paul really sort of stepping out and taking a chance because it's not like everybody agreed with the sentiment give iron back to the irish uh so you know and uh henry mccullough who had just joined the band and was irish uh you know actually he and his brother got beat up in a bar because of it. Uh, mm. So, yeah, it was, uh, you know, a lot of people don't think of it much as, you know, one of the great Paul McCartney singles, but it's, I think, an important Paul McCartney single for a number of reasons. Um, I would also choose uh, High, High, High and Sea Moon, mainly because of High, High, High. I don't, I don't like Sea Moon all that much, but, I mean, it's okay. It has some of his sort of, you know, not quite up there lyrics like it will be l7 and i'll never get to heaven if i fill my head with glue i mean give me a break um although i kind of <laughs> like the l7 thing you know the l7 l7 is a square right. you know but high 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 is really just great and i especially like it because the very first line mentions bootlegs which are very mm. near to my heart um 
<laughs> Interestingly, you know, that was um, that faced some radio problems too, uh, because of you know I'm going to get high, high, high is uh, you know made it seem like a drug song, and it kind of was. Um, you know, again in the research for this book, I was looking at some of the session sheets, and all of the session sheets spell the title like this: H I G H H I. H-I-G-H. -H. And that includes the session sheets for the live recordings that were made in Europe in 1972, some of which just came out on the, uh, you know, Bruce McMouse and also the Live in Europe extra disc that uh, was part of that deluxe edition of Red Rose Speedway, mm. uh, etc. And Wildlife. Those those session sheets also spell it, you know, high as in getting high, then high as in hello, and then high as in getting high. So, you know, it came out as a single, just H-I-H-I-H-I, -H -I -H -I, making it, you know, in, in a way, it, it's almost as if he sort of stepped back and is hiding behind the idea that it might just mean hello, 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 but it clearly meant, you know, like getting high. Or it could have just meant up there in terms of height who knows well we know or um, but then, about having your head filled with glue <laughs> uh, yeah right you, you know are... right on the other side of the single i mean there's another clue for you all hey uh, <laughs> there it is we uncovered the great secret yeah. it is a drug song about sniffing glue the whole single that's right everyone thought it was about marijuana <laughs> But there was also the controversy that some people thought that there were sexually suggestive lyrics. Right. Get you ready uh, for. Uh, uh, get my, you ready my, for my body gun. Some right. people thought is what he was saying when it was polygon. He actually said polygon, but I believe he admitted in the um, booklet for the. Uh, which one is this on Red Rose Speedway now? Uh -huh. uh, that that body gun is actually a better line. <laughs> But yeah. Polygon is kind of funny. I mean, it doesn't mean it doesn't make any sense. Body Gun makes much more sense. Um, but uh, yeah, there's there's that too. So you've got between Polygon and L7, you've got some peculiar lyric choices here. But uh, but I like the single. I like the sound of high. I like the energy in high high high. Uh, sea Moon. You know, there's some nice arrangement touches there. The trumpet, the um, vibraphone, xylophone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's that, and that leaves Ringo, which, as we've all said, comes down pretty much to a Don't Come Easy in early 1970. The only thing I can add, and I might have said this on the show before, I'm not sure, early 1970 is seemingly the song that was originally called Four Nights in Moscow. Four Nights in Moscow was one of those titles that used to come up on Beatles bootlegs in the very early days uh, and mentioned as one of those unreleased songs and uh, was on a lot of lists. And I asked Ringo about it. I said, you know, do you remember recording a song called Four Nights in Moscow? And uh, I think George produced and John was somehow involved in it. And, and he said, no, you, you just read that in someone's book. And I said, oh, no. And I pulled out the session sheet for that, which I happened to have. And he looked at it and he said, you know, I really have no idea what this is, but it was an actual EMI session sheet. And the only thing I can figure is that it had to be four nights in Moscow because it's all, you know, when he comes to town, I hope he'll play with me. Uh, when he comes to town, I know he's going to play with me. I mean, it, it seems to to fit, you know, what that title would have been, what's going on there. Um, and the date was about right for when that would have been recorded. So, hmm. yeah, so there's just a little tidbit for you. Um, I never knew that, and I don't know if I've ever heard of Four Nights in Moscow. <laughs> really? Ah. Well, yeah. Well, because you're a youngin'. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> youngin'? Yeah, I mean, you and well, now I live in the country. I can say stuff like that. You know? I feel like this is this is Little House on the Prairie. I think. You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I mean, you know, you you said you were five when Hey Jude came out. And, yeah, you know, I was in high school. I mean, no, I was at, when Hey Jude came out. I was three. Uh, the Hey Jude album. I mean, the Hey Jude album. Yes, I right. actually February, it was a few weeks before my fifth birth. Mm. <laughs> Um, but uh, I know, but those little things like the age and stuff—that's important to me. That I can 
hang a lot of these singles and albums onto you know those very for- early formative years when absolutely you know and I, well i guess that uh, brings uh, brings to an end our 7 hour show uh <laughs> and uh folks this was our white album okay things we said today white album version uh a lengthy show hope you enjoyed our picks of our singles please of course share with us your thoughts on the songs the singles Ken mentioning uh, sausages and and panties earlier on, <laughs> and um, <laughs> and the fun that we had in recapping all the news and your record store day shopping. So I guess that uh, brings to a close this edition of things we said today. So let's go around the table here. Contact information. I'm Darren Devivo from WFUV in New York City. It's the easiest ways to reach me. Or to send me an email at WFUV, and the address is Darren DeVivo, spelled out, D-A-R-R-E-N-D-E-V-I-V-O, at WFUV.org. Or go to Facebook and like the page called Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio, and uh, we'll be connected. And over to Alan. Okay, the easiest way to get to me is through Facebook. Um, You can write to me either uh, at Alan Cozen on Facebook or Alan Cozen Remixed. And uh, you can reach all of us at by email at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. We have a Twitter presence, which is at things we said fab. And we have a group Facebook page, which is Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans. And we put out the show in various formats on Podbean, on YouTube, etc. And you can put comments on those places, too. And on to Ken. Okay, if you want to get in touch with me directly, you can email me at everylittlething at att.net. Be sure to visit my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. As I hope you know, there is a Beatles trivia page where you can win one of nine prizes every week. And periodically, I get new prizes to give away. And I just got the brand new Blu-ray for the movie I Want to Hold Your Hand, which has just come out from the Criterion Collection with bonus tracks on it. And I also have a special contest coming your way, which will start probably the end of this week. I would figure maybe around April 12th. A couple of years ago, there was a book that came out called Ringo Starr and the Beatles Beat by Alex Kane and Terry McCusker. And it's a detailed look at Ringo's drumming in the Beatles and all the percussive work that was done in the Beatles um, on so much of their songs. And um, it's a very thick book, and you can win it on my website. Just go to KenMichaelsRadio.com for all the details. And be sure to check out my other podcast, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. The next show is actually going to be this coming Monday, which is April the 15th, Tax Day. And usually, both these shows, Things We Said Today and Talk More Talk, go out the same week. And now, that's all been screwed up. So it's (laughs) going to be every other... We're going to flip each week. This week, it's Things We Said Today week. Next week, it's Talk More Talk. I don't know what we'll be talking about in our next show, but it'll be next Monday at uh, 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Go to our Facebook page, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. Join me, Ken Womack, Kid O'Toole, and Tom Hunyadi for that show. And I think that covers everything. I think we're all set. And I was going to say, one of these weeks, we will probably uh, unscrew things up so that the two shows to two podcasts are coming out the same week uh, as it, they did uh, once upon a time. Well, you know, so- for those of us who miss the days when this show was every week, what you can do is take this show... And listen to one hour one week, and then the second hour the next week. This is sort of like John saying, just take my single, Paul single, George's <laughs> That's single, right. Ringo That's single, right. and you got a new Beatle album. There you go. Well, for uh, Ken Michaels and Alan Cozen, uh, I'm Darren DeVivo. Thanks so much for uh, spending uh, this week-long show with us. I'm just joking. Thanks for spending time with us here at Things We Said Today. We'll be back in a couple of weeks, and we will see you next time on Things We Said Today.